thank you very much and good morning to you all. Um, so over the past five years, uh, I've spent uh, a significant amount of my time studying the bacteria that live in our body and on our body. Uh, a lot of people refer to them as the human microbiome. So what does the human microbiome mean to your good life? And it's certainly, this talk is going to be a lot different from Emilia's talk because you may not think as much about the bacteria in your body as uh, you think about your, uh, how you perceive life. But I would argue that the bacteria that you have in your body have a significant effect on your health. And while we haven't yet identified it to sort of find the, the happy bug that makes your life be very good, uh, we certainly have found things that uh, are very important um, in determining how you think about yourself. So before I get going, I want to, um, to start uh, explaining to you what makes me study uh, these bacteria. Um, as a researcher, I enjoy the privilege that I can basically decide completely what I want to study without any limitations. And I've chosen to study the microbiome. So why have I done that? Well, um, the microbiome is extremely fascinating to me because it's something that we all have and it represents a piece of nature that has a very significant effect on us. Within our body, we have hundreds of different species of microbes that are each of which are more different from each other than say a zebra from Africa and seaweed from Japan. They interact to form a very complex community um, that affects our health. And we actually have the power, or we will have the power very soon, to control our microbiome. So basically, the punchline for my talk is that I'll tell you how the microbiome cont controls your health and how you can control your microbiome. So most people have a pretty good idea about what bacteria are. Uh, there are tiny, tiny organisms that cause disease. Um, and certainly there are bacteria that, that do that. So how tiny are these bacteria? So bacteria are about one micrometer in size. That means that within a cup of espresso, we can have over 10 times as many bacteria than we have humans on our planet. Bacteria are able to colonize more or less every place on Earth. And because they are so good at doing this, there are so many bacteria that I won't even say the number on the planet. What that means is that they're extremely diverse. And this diversity is uh, extremely fascinating for the people who work with bacteria. So on a good day, I sort of feel like uh, you know, one of the, the old explorers that were you know, uh, sailing across the Atlantic to find new, new continents with new species and everything. Because we do find new species all the time that are much more different than what uh, Columbus found in, uh, in say, America. Um, so anyway, so bacteria are small, but um, if I asked you to raise your hand if you've had an infection, have you, have you had a bacterial infection, food poisoning or anything? Okay, so probably most of you have had that. So you all know that in spite of being very small, they can really affect your health. So you've all felt the power of bacteria on your body. So the bacteria that we have in our body, how many are there actually? Um, so it sort of depends on how we quantify them. So if we take our body and we weigh the part of our body that is human and we weigh the part of our body that is bacterial, we would found, find that we're actually about 20 times more human than we're bacterial. So, so I guess in that sense, bacteria in our body would constitute a small one or two small organs in our body. However, if we grind up our body and we count the number of cells that are in our body, we're actually outnumbered by bacteria 10 to 1. So we're only 10% human uh, on a cell number basis. And in biology, genes is what matters. And if we count the genes that are in our body, we're actually less than 1% human. And over 99% bacterial. So, so one could really argue whether we are humans or whether we're just a, a, a host for bacteria. <laughs> um, so this, this community that lives on our body 
um, differs from bacteria that cause infections. So bacteria that cause infections is typically one type of bacteria that enters your body and it starts to multiply and starts to cause a disease, but it's identical. As I mentioned, the, the microbiome is very diverse and we have hundreds of different species and they form really a community. And I think the best analogy uh, to this community is the global community on our planet. Each country has a population uh, that varies in, in some extent, but is fairly homogeneous. And each country uh, or each nation interacts with other nations in a variety of different ways. So they can trade with each other, they can communicate, or they can wage war against each other. And all of those things happen in all of your bodies as we sit here. There are tiny bacteria that exchange nutrients, trade with each other, that signal to each other, communicate with each other, and that wage war against each other, produce compounds that kill the other bacteria. So, so it's very different, the bacteria that we have in our body, from the bacteria that cause infections. But now that you know that we have so many bacteria in our body, and you know from your own experience that bacteria have a lot of power to affect your health, it, it should be no wonder that these bacteria play a significant role in our health. I want to give you a few examples of how or which aspects of your health is controlled by bacteria. So, a pretty interesting example is obesity. In, in the Western world, we, we're set to have an obesity epidemic, and uh, researchers has over the past five years really found out that uh, bacteria are a very important part in regulating body weight in individuals. Um, the first experiments, uh, well, uh, let me go back, say, bacteria live in the intestine, and so when we eat food, as humans, we can only digest part of it. So we rely on the bacteria in our intestines to digest more of our food. The bacteria that live in our intestines, in return for living their protected life with lots of good food, they give us back some nutrients. They give us back some energy. And if these bacteria are slightly more efficient in giving back energy to us, we become obese. And if they're slightly less efficient, we stay lean. And people have observed that there is a, a particular type of bacteria that is more enriched in people who are obese. And they thought, well, maybe that causes obesity. And so they took mice, because sometimes we can't do experiments with humans and people use mice instead. So they took mice that were fat and they took mice that were thin. And they took mice that didn't have bacteria in their body. And they took the bacteria from the fat mouse and put it into a, a mouse that didn't have bacteria in the body. And they took the bacteria from the lean mouse and put it into a mouse that didn't have bacteria in the body. And then they put them on the scale and weighed their body weight. And the mice that got the bacteria from the fat mice gained much more weight than the mice that got their bacteria from the lean mouse. So that really showed that the microbiome plays an important role in regulating obesity. The microbes also do a lot of other good things for us. They produce vitamins and other nutrients that we need uh, to live our good life. <laughs> um, and uh, there is a variety of things that they affect us. They, they're not all good, these bacteria that live in our body, because people have actually found that there is uh, a particular bacterium that is present in many microbiomes, or most of our microbiomes, which can cause cancer. So it's not all bliss. And this bacterium has actually evolved the ability to inject small molecules into your cells in your body that make them more likely to develop cancer. So anyway, these are just a few examples. There are a lot more. But the microbiome is very important for your health. But I mentioned before that um, I think uh, we can control our microbiome. And so if we want to control our microbiome, uh, we need to understand how the microbiome is affected by our lives. And so when we're born, we're born sterile. We have no bacteria in our body. But from the moment we pop out into the real world, we get colonized by bacteria. And basically every action we take in our lives 
affects our microbiome. If we're born with a cesarean section versus born vaginally, that affects our microbiome. If we get breast fat or we get formula fat, that affects our microbiome. When we start eating solids, affect our microbiome. What solids we eat. If we get sick, if we take drugs, if we take antibiotics, if we go to Thailand on a summer vacation or whatever, that affects our microbiome. So one can really say that the microbiome is a true reflection of our entire life history. And because of that, all of our microbiomes are very different. So, so your microbiome is very different from my microbiome, which is very different from your microbiome. And much more so than, for instance, your genome and your genome and my genome. And that is because all these choices and all these actions we do change our microbiome. The good thing about that is that we have hopes to be able to modify our microbiome. It's much more difficult to modify our genome, but we can change our microbiome. And I think this is the future of medicine, uh, where we are able to tailor uh, our microbiomes to suit our particular human health needs. And so I will um, sort of uh, end off with this example of uh, how uh, a microbiome can be tailored to solve an important uh, health problem. There is a disease which is uh, caused by a bacterium called Clostridium difficile. It's a disease that happens uh, or typically occurs when people uh, get their microbiome wiped out. Say they take antibiotics and a large part of their microbiome dies. And this gives room for this bacterium to start infecting the body. It's a life-threatening infection uh, and actually kills thousands of people uh, every year. Some people are so unfortunate that they suffer from recurrent infections, so they get this infection over and over again. And researchers have long known that this disease is caused by imbalances in the microbiome. Their microbiomes are not as diverse uh, as healthy people's microbiome. So goes to the embracing diversity uh, point from the previous talk. Same thing applies to our microbiome. When it's diverse, it's much more robust. So there was a, a group of doctors that I think were sort of, uh, I would say, pretty visionary. They, they realized this and they said, well, what we need to do to treat this disease is we need to transplant the microbiome. We need to do the same thing as we did for the mice. But um, you, people are not born sterile, so you can't really do the same thing. But they did an approximation uh, to this. And what they did was they took from these spouses of these individuals suffering from this disease, they had them deliver fecal samples to the doctor. And uh, the doctor took these fecal samples and introduced them into the intestines of the sick people through tubes going in through the mouse, mouth and, um, and then saw what, what happens. Um, and, uh, and to their great uh, pleasure, they found that <laughs> they did not go through this uh, procedure for no reason, but in fact, uh, this procedure cured their disease, and they became healthy. They resolved the disease. And this has been replicated in several different hospitals around the world. And I think this highlights, while it's a very crude way of uh, tackling, uh, you know, tailoring the microbiome, it certainly highlights the power of harnessing the microbiome for, um, for treating human health. So... I want to leave you with this story, and I want to, you to think about this. I don't necessarily want you to go home and do just that, uh, to, to become thin or something like that, but um, we're all working very hard to bring this type of medicine to you, and I think you can count on this in the future for addressing your uh, health problems. Thank you.